Hello, and welcome to Meet the Candidates, a show where we give residents the opportunity to learn a little bit more about who's running for office, whether we find out their favorite animal or why we should vote for them. Whatever the question, we get the answers. I'm your host, Candace Mashat, and right now I have with me candidate for school board, Flint Board of Education, Mr. Dylan Luna. Hello, Dylan. Hey, good evening. How are you? I am well. I am well. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Just getting into this, Dylan. Give us a little bit of uh, about your background. Yeah, of course. So, a reason that I got involved in this education uh, race is because as a young kid, I couldn't read. I was in third grade and I was struggling with reading comprehension. So my mother put me in a better school. And in that school, I excelled so much that I graduated second in my class. And it really pushed me to study public policy and in particular educational policy at Michigan State. And I thought I was gonna go to law school to pursue that career. Um, I realized in my senior year that to be more, to be a better advocate for education, I should be a teacher. So I joined what's called Teach for America. And I had my first classroom on the south side of Chicago in Inglewood teaching high school Spanish. From then, I spent two years in Detroit teaching students from kindergarten to eighth grade in Spanish. I spent a year and a half uh, teaching elementary education in Flint, uh, all subjects. And you know, after a couple of years in the classroom, I did pursue uh, my next step in educational policy. I spent three years fighting for things like better uh, per people funding policies to better uh, retain and attract educators. And I did that in five states, um, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, Colorado, and Michigan. And 2021, I came back to the city of Flint, the great city of Flint. And in my current role, I work at the Flint and Genesee Group, and I manage our business attraction program, trying to bring new capital and investment into our city and county to pay for things like public schools, roads, and all those good city services we like to have. All that to say, I've been a lifelong um, advocate for public education, and I believe that the city of Flint has a lot of potential to become a better city, but it really starts with our schools. Now, at one point in time, thank you for that, by the way, Dylan. At one point in time, uh, Flint Community Schools were a model for the country as far as education. Yeah. And now, you know, the story is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. but one of the models at Flint Community School is that Flint Community Schools are still the best choice. Obviously, if you are running for a uh, school board, please explain to us why you believe that Flint Community Schools are still the best choice. Well, here's the, here's, I call it the Bureau, the Bureau of Honesty. Mm -hmm. Roughly 15,000 students reside in the city of Flint. Less than 3,000 students choose to attend our schools. So for the majority of families who have children K through 12th grade, Flint schools aren't the best choice because they don't attend the schools. That being said, uh, we have amazing educators. We have an amazing superintendent and our students are some of the best in the country, both academic and athletic wise, hence our strong uh, legacy of alumni, athletes, you name it. But here's the issue. When you have a dysfunctional, weak board of education mm -hmm. whose body is to govern the district, uh, a lot of students and educators and families can't thrive under that governance. I'll give you a, a, an example, right? In Westwood Heights district, over 75% of the students are Flint residents. The superintendent, Mr. Key, is a former Flint teacher. You ask, why would that district have so many Flint students and why would a former Flint teacher teach at a different district? Well, because quite frankly, it wasn't the best choice for them and they weren't in an environment that they could thrive in. And when I use the word environment, I mean both a physical environment and also a cultural environment, right? When I say physical, our buildings are on average about 60 plus years old. Some schools have no heat, not the best heat. You go to a school in the middle of the summer and it's super hot because the HVAC system isn't working that well. We have one school, uh, Dora Ryder, 
it was so contaminated with, with the with mold that those students are joined together at Potter. So the physical environment doesn't conduce our students and staff to a thriving environment where they can be the best choice. But also when a board is so dysfunctional, um, the culture comes from the top to the bottom mm -hmm. and the students and staff see that hence there's such a turnover when it comes to our student enrollment, but also our staff. Great. And so, and first of all, thank you for your transparency and your honesty mm -hmm. with your answer for that. Uh, and I, I would imagine that you have already kind of envisioned ways that you can make some of the changes to a few of the things that you've talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, I know that you are running on a slate. Yes. And my question to you is, if everyone on your slate uh, does not get elected with you, uh, are you willing to work with the whomever is elected? And if uh, you are the only new person that's elected, are you willing to work with the, the current board? And how do you see yourself fitting into that and being a positive change there? Let me first be blunt with that. I am working hard every day to make sure myself, Emily Dore, Emily Relaford, Saray King and Michael Clack are elected to five open seats on the board. That being said, I won't just work with anybody. I'll work with anyone who's elected to produce results because you can work with folks for months and years on end and not produce one good result. So my, my mission as one out of seven board members is to work with the collective majority to achieve deliverable transformational results for students, staff, families in the community. Okay. And I know you talked about um, the physical environment uh -huh. that, that students are subjected to when they're attending the schools that sometimes, you know, uh, the heating may not be up to par when it's really cold outside or sometimes when it's really hot outside in the summertime that it um, that is extremely hot in the building. So what do you propose uh, to do about those issues? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give the, uh, the current board credit. You know, they, they'd been getting money from the federal government since the COVID pandemic started through the CARES Act, um, their American Rescue Plan Act. You know, they receive these funds through what's called ESSER funds, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. So I give them credit for uh, just approving an appropriation to get some of the parking lots um, kind of taken care of because I guess I coached at Brownell um, this past spring for track. And then this last uh, summer, sorry, this last fall of 2021 doing cross country and these potholes were outrageous. I mean, geez, it just wasn't fair to the students, families, teachers and visitors to some of these schools. So I give them credit for finally appropriating money to fix the parking lots. But what I would like to do if I was on the board is make sure this money is invested well. And I use the word invest, not spend, but invested well when it comes to facilities when it comes to student achievement, and when it comes to retaining and attracting talent from the teacher to the parapro. All this money has defined uses of what it can be used for and what it can't be used for. So making sure that's done correctly, because you don't want to give that money back to the federal government, right. but also making sure the money is spent wisely, invested well, and spent with some kind of urgency. And when I, I use the word urgency because our district and students aren't uh, in a very urgent need of better leadership, but also resources from facilities to things to get them back after a whole two year COVID pandemic and also the Flint water crisis. When you spend meetings that last four, five, six hours and you get very little achieved or nothing achieved, where you have over 100 point of orders and point of information, but the word student achievement isn't mentioned once or we spend two back-to-back -back meetings and there's been no action on over 20 blighted properties. It's just, it, it, it's, not, it's not helping students, our teachers, or the city of Flint. And so you mentioned earlier that there were about 17,000 students mm -hmm. that live in the city of Flint. And a big chunk of those students do not attend Flint Community Schools. Mm -hmm. So what would be a plan that you have in place to help attract those students back to Flint Community Schools? Yeah, so I have a five point plan, but if you look at uh, other members of the slate that we're running on, we have very similar identical kind of priorities. So number one, 
it begins with our facilities. Um, you know, I've been a teacher in a, in a not so great classroom in Detroit. It's the middle of like May, you're wearing a shirt. And I had a tie when I taught, but you're wearing a shirt and tie. You're on the second floor, it's about 2.30. There's no uh, AC and the sun's hitting you. The teacher is hot, the students are hot, it's hard to focus. So as a board, taking care of those bigger picture things like having high quality buildings, it gives towards a conducive learning environment and it helps teachers and students be their better best when you know it's not hot or it's not cold. You can worry about other things like learning and teaching. So getting our facilities in order, right? Renovating uh, existing buildings that need an investment after 50, 60 plus years, but also giving our students a high school or two that they deserve, that they can be proud of. You know, when you walk into a school that's literally falling apart from the parking lot to the roof, that doesn't really instill school pride. When you walk into a newer building, a renovated building, you're gonna have a sense of pride. So really having safe and learning centric facilities. Another big thing is having wraparound services. A lot of our students, I would even say a majority of our students come from a disadvantaged background or they're, they come from poverty, right? Mm -hmm. So making sure our schools can be places where they can have uh, certain health services, whether it be dental, mental health, uh, where they can see a nurse and work to get what they need done, our referral, that will help our students be better prepared to enter the classroom and focus. If you come to the classroom with a toothache, you can't focus. If your parents work in two or three jobs and you have to watch your siblings at night, you come to school tired, you need to have some kind of, you know, snack, some kind of supports at the school to help you be your best self. Um, when it comes to school funding, the school board has a limited role directly, right? Because the majority of school funding comes from the state on a perfectable basis and students who are disadvantaged get certain benefits, right? So if you're a special ed student, there's extra money tacked on to your perpetual funding. If you're learning a, a career technical program, that's extra money. So making sure that the state and the federal government um, know what our needs are, and that's really a bully pulpit kind of advocacy. So being a good advocate at the state and federal level when it comes to school funding. One of the biggest things is also supporting the environment for a good school curriculum to educate the whole child, whether that be uh, us offering skill trades to our students in high school, middle school, um, for those who want to pursue college, making sure when they get to college, they can read, write, do math, and articulate themselves in a manner that's effective. And for our students who don't want to go into skill trades or college, making sure that we give them the pathway to join the armed forces, become an entrepreneur, or do something productive in society. Um, finally, I think it's one of the most important pieces is empowering our educators from the teacher to the parapro to the custodian. Um, we need to take a hard look at compensation when it comes to what they make. And it's not that much for a starting salary, right? When I taught in Detroit in 2014, my starting salary was $39,000 eight years ago. In Flint Community Schools, this last school year, the starting salary was about 35,000. So 39, eight years ago, 2021, 2022, 35 with inflation, with all kinds of things that are going on. It's just not a good way to keep teachers and attract new ones. So that's where I would start. But I will say one thing, and I don't want to ramble on. You know, I've been to over 80 community events in the city of Flint for my school board race, whether it be block clubs, uh, virtual means on water quality, um, you know, community events. And I engage and listen with folks. I knock doors, I let them talk, and I hear their concerns. And I went to one block club meeting um, near Central High School. And when I asked them, you know, do your board members come to these meetings? They're like, no, you're the first candidate that I can remember. So really engaging people and meeting them where they are is important because if you can't listen to your constituents and what their concerns are, you're not really making informed decisions as a policymaker. So um, Dylan, I, and I'm just wondering, and this is a very important question. Mm -hmm. So I want you to take your time to think about this. Um, being on the school board means making decisions for, you know, our youth, for our children. Mm -hmm. And 
So it means you have to know and understand the current culture that we live in. Right. What's the most popular cartoon out right now, Dylan? The most popular <laughs> cartoon? Yes. I mean, I think it differs by age group. If like you're in like elementary school, it could be something on the Disney channel. Um, if you're like in middle school, high school, it could be like a, a family guy. But it's just hard to tell. I'm, look, I, I can barely keep up with the music coming out and I'm only 30 years old, so. I mean, listen, that's an even better question. Are you prepared to do TikTok videos with the students once you welcome them back to Flint School? Yeah, I mean, look, I know there's a big controversy with the cell phones in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'm an advocate of using technology whether it be an iPad, cell phone, a smart board. And I believe, you know, right. the right kind of expectations that we could use things like TikTok and Twitter. Um, when I was teaching, we used Class Dojo. But there's just so much stuff you can do that really get kids out their feet. I mean, no student wants to just be sitting in a class facing a wall on a whiteboard for 45 minutes in different segments. You need brain breaks, right? We had this thing called uh, Flocabulary. Um, which kind of combined like curriculum with rapping and a visual kind of, you know, um, background. So students definitely want to be energized and out their feet as much as possible. I never sat down when I taught. I sat down when I ate lunch, maybe. Absolutely. And I think you make a really good point there when you talk about the fact that um, uh, the youth today are more exposed to technology and they have so many different things at their fingertips and different tools and there are different ways uh -huh. to um, teach them now. So when it comes to Flint Community Schools and bringing Flint Community Schools up to date and being able to really educate on the level of other school districts, I mean, even other countries, what are some of the uh, technology ideas that you have about adding to education? Yeah, so I will say this. I went to Potter Elementary earlier this week. I got invited by a friend of mine who's a teacher. By the way, I want to reiterate, we have some of the best teachers in the country mm -hmm. and our students have some of the most potential. Um, so there's a couple of things you could do with technology um, in a in a post COVID society. Well, I only want to see post COVID, but in a COVID era society, it's very important that our students have technology, whether it be a Chromebook or iPad. And not only do they, do they have the technology, do they have internet access that's at a good speed at their home. So ensuring that not only is good for the student, but it's equitable because broadband access is, a, is an equality issue. Um, but within the school building and in the classroom, <clears throat> excuse me, having smart boards <clears throat> for one, right? Mm -hmm. When I was teaching, <clears throat> we were kind of going through like a, a transition from having the whiteboard where you could like sketch and do stuff on it. And that was cool, but we started to go into what's called a Promethean board where you can do a whole lot more. Yes. Um, it's like a giant like touch TV slash computer that engages a whole um, you know, classroom. But you have to realize too, every learner is different. You have students who thrive by visuals, students who thrive with like building blocks, like tactile learners, students who thrive in whole group instruction, and students who, who thrive in small group are individualized instruction. So the technology, they can do all three, right? You can be doing a lesson on your Chromebook on your own. You can be in a small group of like five or six with your teacher or pair pro using technology, or you can be in a whole group instruction, whether you're using the Promethean board, everyone has their own laptop, or shoot, there was one program we did um, where like I put up like a QR code and the students had like an iPad and like you could like kind of like answer the question um, using like Jeopardy. So like you do a lesson and you do a quick, what's called a check for understanding to make sure they got it. And if like 80% of the students couldn't answer the question that tells the teacher that you have to, you have to reformat the lesson. Mm -hmm. that day. But all that to say, as a board member, I'm not gonna be teaching students. Your job as a volunteer board member is to govern. We wanna make sure that the schools, the teachers, and the individual students are equipped with some of the most effective and best technology in which to succeed. And that's the right. appropriation process. Right. 
And um, finally, I know that uh, a lot of times with the meetings, you want to make sure that you're giving out good information, good information to the community, good information to the parents. And sometimes meetings do not have the best attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any way that you can think of that uh, the, the school board will be able to engage parents? You got to meet parents where they are. Um, 2022 is not 2000. It's not 1980. It's not 1970. I get frustrated when I hear people, candidates, et cetera, say, our parents aren't doing like they used to be, or they're not how they used to be. Well, we live in a whole different society, right? When it comes to technology, where it comes to family structure. Yes, in an ideal world, every household would have a strong family structure where they're making good incomes at one job, right? Data shows a lot of our families live in poverty. A lot of our families move from house to house, district to district, school to school, sometimes multiple times throughout the year. We have homeless students, right? Um, parents are working one to three jobs, right? So they have less time in which to engage with their child and also make some of these meetings that you can assume if this parent doesn't come that they don't care about their child's education. Mm -hmm. And really their job is to make sure the child has food, electricity, and clean clothes to go to school every day. All that to say is you have to meet parents where they're at using multiple methods of communication, right? You go to these board meetings, except for the board meeting last week where a lot of the teachers and staff kind of uh, vetted their frustration with the current dysfunctional board. That's mm -hmm. not normal. You probably get 10, 15 people at these board meetings. So that tells me the board's not meeting parents where they are. You can have board meetings in different areas, in different times of the year, and also the day. One. Two, some parents just won't come to the board meeting because they have to do other things that are higher priority for them. They expect us to take care of our business. So sending out a newsletter to their, to their household via mail, via text, via um, you know email. You can do a quick survey. I'm not trying to do a 50 question survey, but what you could do is send a quick five question survey to parents um, using technology. And you know sometimes it may not work, it's called trial and error, but the, that, the cost of doing these is not high. So the effort to try is really what you can do. Um, but parents aren't engaged because they don't feel empowered to be engaged. Right. And Dylan, I, I just want to thank you for your time this evening. Um, you, you've shared so many thoughts from the fact that you do believe that teachers deserve pay increases uh -huh. uh, to the fact that you believe that um, there should be more money put into buildings so that children are physically comfortable in the environment in which they have to learn to the fact that there should be more money put into uh, just the education period, whether it's adding new technology or even getting up to date books. So uh -huh. you share so many things with us and there's a method to my madness of asking you the very last question of please explain to those of us who may not understand what the school board does, what you're responsible for, and then um, leave us with, after you explain to us what the school board is responsible for, leave us with why we should vote for you in November. Yeah. So the school board's job is to govern the district, right? They are the fiduciary of the school district when it comes to budgets, state, local, and federal grants. Their job is to create the environment where the superintendent, the principals, the teachers, and the students can ultimate, ultimately thrive by providing high quality facilities, funding uh, priorities that help students achieve and be successful, and keeping and attracting teachers. Their job is not to manage or operate um, the district. Their job is to hire and evaluate and sometimes fire the superintendent. We've seen more than five superintendents in a short period of years, and that's not stable for the teachers, principals, our scholars, and quite frankly, the families. So again, to, to summarize, a board's job is to create the environment for success for all those who live in the district and work in the district. And I think that's not happening right now with our current board. 
as to why people should vote for me, I think I'm committed um, to rebuilding trust. Again, 15,000 students, less than 3,000 attend our schools. That's not trust. I'm committed to using my experience as a former educator, as somebody who worked in education policy in five different states, as someone who was educated in policy, business, and education, but that's not my only qualification because I don't know everything. So I'm someone who's committed to working with others, to learn more, to be a better trustee on the board, but ultimately to get things done. And I can promise the folks who come to our board meetings and watch them on Zoom that I'm committed to not having more meetings that last more than a couple hours because you should get the work done in committee and not legislate in live in action at the actual board meeting because that just it's not conducive to a strong district. So thank you, appreciate it. And I will say one thing too, I mentioned money, money, money. There's also a reality. There's 80,000 people roughly who live in the city of Flint and there's about 7,000 General Motors jobs, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have the wealth we did, not even, not, not even back in 2000, let alone 1970. So we have to build partnerships with community members, community organizations, with the state and federal government to back for that loss of revenue to help make our district successful and have what we need to give our students to be successful and to fairly pay our teachers and educators in the classroom. And Dylan, I know I said that that was the final question, but I do want to point out to those who are going to vote in November, which should be everyone, uh -huh. that um, there are a few terms uh, on the ballot. Where, where will we find your name? I'll be running for the six-year term. So there's five open seats, right? There's three six-year terms. I would encourage you to vote for Dylan Luna, Emily Dorr, and Melody Rutherford for those six-year terms. You, you can vote for all three of us. There's a four-year partial term. I would encourage you to vote for Tere King in that four-year partial term. And there's a two-year partial term. I would encourage you to vote for Michael Clack for that two-year partial term. All right, well, Dylan, Luna, thank you for joining us on thank Meet you. the Candidates. Um, we look forward to seeing you in our community as you continue to campaign and just tell us a little bit more about yourself. And I hope that our viewers loved and well i hope that our viewers enjoyed learning uh more about you today thank you so much thank you so much Candace and paul i appreciate y'all have a good night thank you for joining us on meet the candidates if you haven't seen your candidate make sure you have them join us tell them to give us a call at the number below You're really not that talented. You're not attractive. Too fat. You're too short. Too old. Why don't you just give up? Give up. Give up. Just give up.